In this vlog, I will be exploring three of the prominent family cemeteries in Cherokee County, South Carolina. The first cemetery is located off of the historic Smithford Road, where legend has it Confederate gold went missing, down what is now a logging road to the Patrick Family Cemetery. Here, there are 59 visible graves with the surnames of Patrick, Lockhart, Byers, Service, and Peeler. There used to be a back that way a little bit down in Inwood used to be the service house. That was people that lived in there. This is the four forks. This is actually, that way there is the action of the Smith Forward, I think. I might be, I think the, the grave yards of this way. grave belongs to 31-year-old Gabriel Patrick, who was buried here in 1788. He was followed by his 85-year-old father, Gabriel, who passed in 1803. Gabriel Sr. was married to Margaret, and together they had five children, one of which was named Margaret after her mother. This Margaret married John Lockhart. Among their children, was a daughter named Mary who married into the Peeler family. The Peeler family has had a great impact on history as Peelers are associated with the invention of the Singer sewing machine, the telegraph, the hypodermic needle, and cheer wine. The Peelers have also played an important role in farming innovations, the practice of medicine, spreading of religion, and politics. All of the Peelers in this area can trace their lineage back to a German immigrant named Johannes Mueller. He and his three sons took the ship the Molly, which was captained by John Hodgson. They arrived on September the 30th, 1727 in Philadelphia. Eventually, sons Jacob and David settled in Pennsylvania, but by 1748, Son Michael left via the Great Wagon Road to Rowan County, North Carolina. Michael went on to serve in the Revolutionary War. He fathered six children, helped raise funds to have the Grace Lower Stone Church built, and began using the Peeler name. While some of Michael's children would stay in Rowan, the Peelers buried here came from Michael's son, Anthony. Anthony married a lady named Barbara, and by 1779, he had purchased 110 acres near here. At that time, the land was in Union County. His home was known as the Old Peeler Place and was east of the Broad River, a few miles south of Cherokee Ironworks. Together, Anthony and Barbara went on to have five children and 33 grandchildren. Their son, Daniel, married the daughter of John Leake, who was a Revolutionary War veteran and owned a plantation and the Cherokee Ford. Together, Daniel and Lavisa Leakes had 10 children. Daniel's son, Anthony, married Mary Ann Lockhart Peeler. While Anthony isn't buried here, his wife, Mary Ann, is. Out of their seven children, only Anthony Jasper, Mary Ann Christina, also known as Mac, and John Rufus is buried here. Anthony Jasper Peeler joined the Confederacy, as did his older brothers, John Rufus, Daniel Morgan, John Newton, and Daniel Smith. Anthony Jasper Peeler was in the Company F with the 15th Infantry. Unfortunately, Anthony Jasper was killed at the First Battle of Winchester fighting for Stonewall Jackson. 
As far as Daniel Madison Peeler, he survived and is buried here too. David Smith Peeler was captured near Fayetteville, North Carolina and was a prisoner of war at Point Lookout, Maryland until he was released in June of 1865. I have heard that John Rufus was also held here as a POW too. J. Newton was in General Kershaw's brigade and was wounded in Maryland Heights, Virginia in 1862 before being discharged. Mary, or Mac, was born in 1839 and died in 1904 at the age of 74. As a young woman, she married John Franklin Patrick, and together they had three children. Her husband John answered the call, but unfortunately was blown up in Pittsburgh, Virginia. It was 1864, and he was 34 years old. Mac, along with John's parents, John and Isabella, who were also laid to rest here, placed his remains here, or had a marker placed here for him. The following year, they also had to bury John's 24-year-old brother, Robert. Robert Patrick had enlisted on February the 1st, 1862 as a private. He mustered into F Company, South Carolina's 18th Infantry. He died from disease as a POW on February the 5th, 1865 in Elmira, New York. John Rufus Peeler served under General Joseph Johnson. Luckily, during the war, he only lost a finger, after which he became a teamster. John Rufus was captured near the end of the war in Greensboro, North Carolina. After the war, he was a farmer and a teacher. He and his wife, Sarah Hambright, who was the daughter of the Revolutionary War hero, Frederick Hambright, had one son together before she died. At her death, her son was nine years old. Eventually, John Rufus did remarry and had eight children with Martha Blackwell. He was a member of Smyrna ARP Church and lived near his and Sarah's son, James Madison, until he passed at age 74. In 1807, he had walked to a store in Wilkinsville, South Carolina, and after getting home, he suffered a heart attack. While Rufus is here, Martha was buried in another cemetery, and Sarah was placed behind her heroic father. Of John Rufus's children, only Sarah's child, James Madison Peeler, is buried here. James Madison Peeler was also a farmer and married Christina Martin. He was a very reputable and respected man in the area. Together, he and his wife had 16 children. James Madison was laid to rest near his wife in 1937 at the age of 76. Christina passed away in 1926 at the age of 56. While most of James Madison's heirs are not buried here, you can find their seven-year-old daughter Pearl, who passed away in 1904 here, and she is beside her 19-year-old brother James Thomas, who was buried here in 1904. Christina also had an infant buried here in 1911.
The second cemetery we went to is on the side of Wilkinsville Highway in Gaffney, South Carolina, and it is known as the LeMasters Family Cemetery. Of the 51 graves here, the oldest is that of Rachel LeMaster, who died at only four months old in 1873. Some of the other interesting people buried here include Albert L. Hammett. He was born in 1876 and passed away at the age of 67. During his life, he moved away from the area and moved to Galveston, Texas, where he lived for 40 years. After he passed away, he was sent home to be laid to rest here by his sister Alice and his three brothers. Unnamed Painter Infant This five-month-old infant belonged to Mr. Horace Painter and passed away in 1906. This occurred as Mr. Painter was busy shucking corn and the child's mother was busy milking the cows. It is written that when Mr. Painter heard a cry coming from the house, he ran in to find a house fire had spread to the infant's crib. Both parents desperately tried to save their child, but to no avail. Hamlet LeMaster was 21 years old when he died in 1901. He was in the advertising business and a manager at Furman. Francis Grubber Francis was an immigrant from Cornwall, England, and a Civil War veteran. He passed away in 1904 at the age of 68. Julius Spencer Hammett. Julius was also a Confederate, and he passed away at the age of 84 in 1923. Virgil Dean Sellers. Virgil was a private in Company C of the 118th Infantry. He was sent to France where he perished in 1918 at a mere 25 years of age. William Weber. William Weber died at 84 years old. He was a farmer and a member of Buford Street Methodist. He and his wife Susan were married on his birthday. During their 50th wedding anniversary, they shared a picture with the Gaffney Ledger. Together, they had seven daughters and a son. Bonnie Upchurch Sellers. Bonnie died at the age of 88, and she was my great-grandfather Calvin Upchurch's sister. She is beside her husband, Boyce, who passed away at age 43. Boyce's brother was Private Virgil Sellers, who was killed in France. Beside them is also their son, Boyce Earl. He was a Korean veteran and passed away at age 70. Boyce Earl's wife, Edith Mulnack Sellers, was a homemaker and a member of McCown's Mountain Baptist Church. She got to live to see her one son have two children, and when she passed, she had five great-grandchildren. She was the last to be buried here in 2005. Calvin's sister? Yeah. And this is her son and his wife. I work... Well, I, Daddy always called him cousin. I never understood why Daddy called him cousin until I realized it. What's the woodsman of the world? I can't tell you because it's an insurance company, but uh, my great grandpa John, John Thomas was a woodsman of the world, but he don't have that kind of grave marker. Before I move on, I would like to talk about Rebecca Sparks Seller, who was buried here. She was born in 1825 of Shelton Sparks and Rebecca Scott, who also had seven other children. Rebecca married Henry Sellers, and I could find no record of any children. She died at the age of 93 in 1919. Interestingly, when researching her, I found out that her father, Shelton, who was buried at Corinth in their cemetery, was murdered. An article published about the murder reads as follows. A terrible tragedy committed over 26 years ago, Spartanburg, South Carolina, April 17th. 
a sensation that reveals the tale of a horrible murder and relates a story of deep-dyed villainy was unearthed in the county today. Not since the murder of Captain Dawson has South Carolina been so startled. Not since the recital by McDowell of his assassination that nightly editor has there been told such a story, a cruel, cowardly murder. Prominent people are connected with its perpetuation, and every other detail makes revelations most sensational. An aged man surrounded by family and riches, garn red by fair and foul means, with indication of impending disillusion, and with a name already blotched beyond reparation, is arrested quietly and silently for a murder committed nearly 26 years ago. This man so rich, so doubly prominent is Samuel Jeffries, a resident of this county, he is the brother of one of the signers of the secession ordinance, who was a man of deep piety and profound learning. In every way, he is well connected with the first families of Carolina. He is about 70 years of age and is the richest man in this section. Just about the end of the war, Samuel Jeffries killed a neighbor named Shelton Sparks. Jeffries, on account of his riches, did not go to war, but hired a substitute. Sparks was a conscript officer, and about close of 1864, attempted to compel Jeffries to go into the army. But his cowardice was too great. This result was that Jeffries went into the woods and hid away from the conscript officer. Bloodhounds were put on his track by some mishap. He was never apprehended. Enraged at the conduct of the conscript officer, Jeffries soon sought a difficulty with him and killed his official pursuer. About the close of the war, when everything was in a condition of irretrievable chaos, the trial of Jeffries for the murder was held. Everybody was interested in the case, and great indignation was expressed. Men of means who condemned this murder attempted to have justice meted out fairly. One of these, Dr. Alexander White, an influential local physician, he denounced the murderer and chanced to obtain some damaging testimony against Jeffreys. This was soon made known to Jeffries and his friends and fell like a bombshell in their camp. How to suppress the damning evidence and save Jeffries' life was the question. Various schemes were hatched to no effect. At last, it was determined to forever silence the tongue of Dr. White by death. The plot was conceived and consummated rapidly. In the darkness of a midsummer night in August 1865, while rocking his motherless child to sleep in his country home, Dr. White was shot dead. That shot was fired through the door. Instantly, Dr. White fell dead. The startled child was awakened by the cruel commotion and the murderers plunged into impenetrable darkness. Shortly after, the child, seeing the blood from the father flowing freely, sat down and dabbled in it. Covered with the gore of its father, the child fell asleep and there beside its parent rested peacefully until his brother discovered the deadly deed. The murderers of Dr. White were unknown suspicion pointed to Samuel Jeffries and several others, but none were arrested or tried for the deed. Soon afterward, the trial of Jeffries for the slaying of Sparks was held. It resulted in an acquittal, despite the fact that Jeffries was anonymously condemned by the people. Since then, he has prospered and today is a very rich man. His character has never been good and many deeds of doubtful fairness have been laid to his account. All of his acts were the fault of a masterly cunning mind. Time and time again, he has been accused of murdering Dr. White, 
but he and his associates kept their secrets well. But his associates, who were not mixed up in the deed, often said publicly that he rarely ever slept and frequently saw the apparitions of his victims. Whether this is true or not, it is certain that he has aged very rapidly and never spoke of his past life. His sole aim seems to have had concealed forever this secret and making money rapidly, but murder will out, and Samuel Jeffries is now on the threshold of a direful personal calamity. When Dr. White was murdered, Jeffries and a man named Medlin were intimate associates. It is believed that Medlin had either been hired by Jeffries to kill White or that he was an abettor of the deed. Medlin had to leave and went to Texas. There he died some years ago and while on his deathbed made the statement exonerating himself and declaring that Jeffries had murdered Dr. White. The confession was kept secret by Medlin's family. Not long ago, Medlin's son told the tale related by his father. This starts anew an old sensation among a few people who were sworn to secrecy. The child who dabbled unconsciously in his parents' lifeblood now a man. While a penniless man, he has been aided by friends in obtaining testimony and the case has been successfully woke up. When Jeffries was arrested at his home in Gaffney, South Carolina, he was sick and is now guarded by deputy sheriffs in his room. Lastly, we went to the service family graveyard. During the 60s, used scare tactics to force a majority of the citizens into selling them their land. This was so that they could build a plant. Construction of the plant began in the early 70s, but by the early 80s, after spending $633 million, the project was abandoned. In the 2000s, again began to buy land for a grand project, which as of today has yet to come to fruition. As a result, has provided the community with a firing range and this land, which is used by the 4-H club, and as hunting land. You don't know where McCown's Mountain is? Can you out point out McCown's Mountain? Uh. I can point it out. I know McCown's Mountain from several vantage points. I uh, thought you was a mountain girl. Where the hell are you from? I don't know. You I'm, dumb bud. <laughs> don't know nothing, hillbilly. Well, I was thinking, is that the tower off of Drainville Mountain? No, it is not. It is not. Girl, okay. stop right here. I got a little place marked. I made my own damn marker so I could measure the angles of all these towers that you can't see because it's hazy. Right here. You see that? I put that there. Oh. This is where I stand with my compass. And I, you see that tower over there? Yeah. That's on the back side of McCown's Mountain, but it's on top of McCown's Mountain. But you see that higher point? Going this way? Yeah. That is McCown's Mountain where you go over that whole ridge is McCown's oh. McCown's Mountain is a long mountain. Uh-huh. And it goes all the way almost to the river. Right. But where you see that little gap up there on top of it, that's where you actually go through the mountain. What plant is that? Putting out all that? Is that a cloud or is that a plant? What do you think it is? I wouldn't have asked if I knew. It is the nuclear plant in Rock Hill. Or York County. Oh. The Paba. Wow, I can't believe we can see that far. You can't know. Yes, you can. You up on the, you up on the And just so you know, you see that little mountain over there? Straight? Yeah, straight. It don't look like a mountain because you're pretty high here, but it's actually a mountain. That's Gilkey Mountain. Okay. Over time, has gotten a nasty reputation by using money to force people into accepting their wrongdoings. Prior to owning it, the land belonged to James Roy McCown, who raised cows here. The McCowns married into the service family, which in the past were the prominent farmers of the area. Today, the service graveyard can be found in a clump of trees surrounded by an old iron fence. Twelve of these graves are documented online. However, I believe there are many more graves marked by mere stones. The first grave placed here was that of James Service. 
James was born in Ireland in 1798. He married Margaret Wilson. Together they had John in 1820. The next year they had Thomas Wilson and in 1823 Eliza. After Eliza was born they decided to come to America. James came first followed by Margaret and the three older children who arrived in Charleston on March 31, 1829. They were aboard the Robert Kerr and sailed from Liverpool, England. James brought his family here to the farmstead he created along London Creek, a tributary that flows into the Broad River. Later, James and Margaret had Mary Ellen in 1830 and Margaret Jane in 1837. By 1839, James's brothers, John and Robert, came from Ireland to settle in the area too. James was very active in the community and was appointed as the postmaster for Draytonville on the 17th of October, 1845. He held this position until his death in 1846. James's oldest son, John Service, was born in Ireland. Seven days after his birth, the infant John was baptized on April the 2nd at, fir at First Belliston Presbyterian Church. Upon growing up in the area, John married Naomi McCown, daughter of George McCown and Jane Lockhart in 1844. John passed away at the age of 33. John and Naomi had a daughter named Margaret who married into the Westnut family and is not buried here. John and Naomi's son George was the youngest. In the winter of 1867, young George Service came down with pneumonia and died. It was the morning of January 15th and he was 13 years old. John and Naomi's middle child went on to marry Captain R. Gaffney, a descendant of Michael Gaffney. She was a socialite and before passing was said to have sung, Near my God to thee. She is also not here and is buried in Oakland Cemetery. In 1852, Thomas Service married Sarah McCown, the sister of his brother's wife. During the Civil War, Thomas served for six months as a private in the Company F. In Sarah's obituary, she is described as being the best woman and had many friends. Thomas's sister Elizabeth, Eliza Service, was the eldest daughter of James and Margaret Wilson. She was born in Ireland and came to the Port of Charleston with her mother. In 1844, she married Andrew Gilmer and they had four children. In the 1850s, she and her family moved to Georgia, but by 1880, she came back home to live with her brother Thomas. Mary Ann Cameron was born in 1806 in Ireland. In 1828, she married Robert Forrest Service Sr., by 1838, she and Robert had three children, John, Elizabeth, and Mary. When they immigrated to America by the way of Liverpool to New York, just days before arriving in the New York Harbor, Mary gave birth to their fourth child, James. Altogether, she and Robert had eight children. It is written that she died on the farm that she loved, on the 15th day of January, 1865, and that she is alongside her husband, Robert, and her children, James, 1838 to 1901, Martha Isabella, 1849 to 1922, and Sally June, 1844 to 1932. Mary and Robert's son, James Star Service, was born on the Star of New York, the captain had to write a letter confirming his birth and declaring Robert and Mary as his parents. While he was 62 at the age of his death, he died a bachelor. He was known to be quiet and reserved, but well respected, and was loved greatly by his family. James Star Service's sister, Martha and Sally, are also buried here. Martha died at 72 
in 1849, and Sally died at age 87 in 1932. Interestingly, as far as I know, the service name is no longer in the area. This is due to the birth of girls, the death of childless fathers, and the migration of some of the men to Georgia, Florida, and Tennessee. That's one of the life expectancy to so let people, children die. Is that graveyard? Yeah. Paul got two, a brother and a sister that's buried down there. Like, two, three, three, so that's what got me interested in that graveyard. He looked for it and then he looked for his grandpa and couldn't find it. He thought they were buried next to the grandpa. That book. The service is really weird. The house we were in was a big picture of the house of the old and the life of the old. That house was pre-Civil War. You don't hear about scraps either. Scraps on most of the land down here. On the river? Yeah. They own most of that land. That's how, that's how that church owned it. They married a scrap. So he came out of the... Uh, North Carolina, Western County. We come off the forks of Kathy's Creek and Broad River. That was where they'd lived for two or three generations before the Civil War. If you enjoyed this video, please like it. If you know anything about these families that I didn't mention, please leave it in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. And as always, thanks for watching.